I have taken the liberty, said Mr. Wednesday, washing his hands in the men's room of Jack's crocodile bar, of ordering food for myself to be delivered to your table. We have much to discuss, after all. I don't think so, said Shadow. He dried his own hands on a paper towel and crumpled it, and dropped it into the bin. You need a job, said Wednesday. People don't hire ex-cons. You folk make them uncomfortable. I have a job waiting. A good job. Would that be the job at the Muscle Farm? Maybe, said Shadow. Nope, you don't. Robbie Burton's dead. Without him, the Muscle Farm's dead too. You're a liar. Of course, and a good one. The best you will ever meet, but I'm afraid I'm not lying to you about this. He reached into his pocket, produced a newspaper much folded, and handed it to Shadow. Page seven, he said. Come on back to the bar. You can read it at the table. Shadow pushed open the door back into the bar. The air was blue with smoke, and the Dixie cups were on the jukebox singing Ico Ico. Shadow smiled slightly in recognition of the old children's song. The barman pointed to a table in the corner. There was a bowl of chili and a burger at one side of the table, a rare steak and a bowl of fries laid in a place across from it. Shadow took his seat at the table. He put the newspaper down. I got out of prison this morning, he said. This is my first meal as a free man. You won't object if I wait until after I've eaten to read your page seven. Not in the slightest bit. Shadow ate his hamburger. It was better than prison hamburgers. The chili was good, but he decided after a couple of mouthfuls it was not the best in the state. Laura made a great chili. She used green cut meat, dark kidney beans, carrots cut small, a bottle or so of dark beer, and freshly sliced peppers. She would let the chili cook for a while, then add red wine, lemon juice, and a pinch of fresh dill, and, finally, measure out and add her chili powders. On more than one occasion, Shadow had tried to get her to show him how she made it. He would watch everything she did from slicing the onions and dropping them into the olive oil at the bottom of the pot on. He had even written down the sequence of events, ingredient by ingredient, and he had once made Laura's chili for himself on a weekend when she had been out of town. It had tasted okay. It was certainly edible, <clears throat> and he ate it, but it had not been Laura's chili. The news item on page seven was the first account of his wife's death that Shadow had read. It felt strange, as if he were reading about someone in a story. How Laura Moon, whose age was given in the article, was 27, and Robbie Burton, 39, were in Robbie's car in the interstate. When they swerved into the path of a 32-wheeler, which sideswiped them as it tried to change lanes and avoid them. The truck brushed Robbie's car and sent it spinning off the side of the road, where the car had hit a road sign, hard, and stopped spinning. Rescue crews were on the scene in minutes. They pulled Robbie and Laura from the wreckage. They were both dead by the time they arrived at the hospital. Shadow folded the newspaper up once more and put it back across the table toward Wednesday who was gorging himself on a steak so bloody and so blue it might never have been introduced to a kitchen boy. Here, take it back, said Shadow. Robbie had been driving. He, he must have been drunk, although the newspaper account said nothing about this. Shadow found himself imagining Laura's face when she realized that Robbie was too drunk to drive. The scenario unfolded in Shadow's mind, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. Laura shouting at Robbie, shouting to him to pull off the road, then the thud of car against truck and the steering wheel wrenching over the car on the side of the road, broken glass glittering like ice and diamonds in the headlights, blood pooling in rubies on the road beside them, two bodies, dead or soon to die, being carried from the wreck or laid neatly by the side of the road. Well, asked Mr. Wednesday. He had finished his steak, sliced and devoured it like a starving man. Now he was munching the french fries, spearing them with his fork. You're right, said Shadow. I don't have a job. Shadow took a quarter from his pocket, tails up. 
He flipped it up in the air, knocking it against his finger as it left his hand to give it a wobble that made it look as if it were turning. Caught it. Slapped it down on the back of his hand. Call, he said. Why? asked Wednesday. I don't want to work for anyone with worse luck than me. Call. Heads, said Mr. Wednesday. Sorry, said Shadow, revealing the coin without even bothering to glance at it. It was tails. I rigged the toss. Rigged games are the easiest ones to beat, said Wednesday, wagging a square finger at Shadow. Take another look at the quarter. Shadow glanced down at it. The head was face up. I must have fumbled the toss, he said, puzzled. You do yourself a disservice, said Wednesday, and he grinned. I'm just a lucky, lucky guy. Then he looked up. Well, I never. Matt Sweeney, will you have a drink with us? Southern Comfort and Coke, straight up, said a voice from behind Shadow. I'll go and talk to the barman, said Wednesday. He stood up and began to make his way toward the bar. Aren't you going to ask what I'm drinking? called Shadow. I already know what you're drinking, said Wednesday. And then he was standing by the bar. Patsy Cline started to sing Walkin' After Midnight on the jukebox again. The man who had ordered Southern Comfort and Coke sat down beside Shadow. He had a short ginger-colored beard. He wore a denim jacket covered with bright sew-on patches and under the jacket a stained white t-shirt. On the t-shirt was printed, If you can't eat it, drink it, smoke it, or snort it, then fuck it. He wore a baseball cap. On this was printed, the only woman I have ever loved was another man's wife. My mother. He opened a soft pack of Lucky Strikes with a dirty thumbnail, took a cigarette, offered one to Shadow. Shadow was about to take one automatically. He didn't smoke, but a cigarette makes good barter material. When he realized that he was no longer inside, you could buy cigarettes here whenever you wanted. He shook his head. You working for a man then? asked the bearded man. He was not sober, although he was not yet drunk. It looks that way, said Shadow. The bearded man lit his cigarette. I'm a leprechaun, he said. Shadow did not smile. Really? he said. Shouldn't you be drinking Guinness? Stereotypes. You have to learn to think outside the box, said the bearded man. There's a lot more to Ireland than, Gu than Guinness. You don't have an Irish accent. I've been over here too fucking long. So you are originally from Ireland. I told you, I'm a leprechaun. We don't come from fucking Moscow. I guess not. Wednesday returned to the table, three drinks held easily in his pot-like hands. Southern Comfort and Coke for you, Matt Sweeney, my man, and a Jack Daniels for me. And this is for you, Shadow. What is it? Taste it. The drink was a tawny golden color. Shadow took a sip, tasting an odd blend of sour and sweet on his tongue. He could taste the alcohol underneath and the strange blend of flavors. It reminded him a little of prison hooch, food in a garbage bag from rotten fruit and bread and sugar and water, but it was smoother, sweeter, infinitely stranger. Okay, said Shadow. I tasted it. What was it? Mead, said Wednesday. Honey wine, the drink of heroes, the drink of the gods. Shadow took another tentative sip. Yes, he could taste the honey, he decided. That was one of the tastes. Tastes kind of like pickle juice, he said. Sweet pickle juice wine. Tastes like a drunken diabetic's piss, agreed Wednesday. I hate the stuff. But then why did you bring it for me? Asked Shadow, reasonably. Wednesday stared at Shadow with his mismatched eyes. One of them, Shadow decided, was a glass eye, but he could not decide which one. I brought you mean to drink because it's traditional, and right now we need all the tradition we can get. It seals our bargain. We haven't made a bargain. Sure we have. You work for me. 
You protect me. You help me. You transport me from place to place. You investigate from time to time. Go places and ask questions for me. You run errands. In an emergency, but only in an emergency, you hurt people who need to be hurt. In the unlikely event of my death, you will hold my vigil. And in return, I shall make sure that your needs are adequately taken care of. He's hustling, eh? said Max Wayne, rubbing his pussy ginger beard. He's a hustler. Damn straight I'm a hustler, said Wednesday. That's why I need someone to look out for my best interests. The song on the jukebox ended, and for a moment the bar felt quiet, every conversation at a lull. Someone once told me that you only get those everybody shuts up at once moments at twenty past or twenty two the hour, said Shadow. Amy pointed to the clock above the bar, held in a massive and indifferent jaw by a stuffed alligator head. The time was eleven twenty. There, said Shadow. Damned if I know why that happened. I know why, said Wednesday. You're gonna share it with the group? I may tell you one day, yes. Or I may not. Drink your mead. Shadow knocked the rest of the mead back in one long gulp. It might be better over ice, he said. Or it might not, said Wednesday. That's terrible stuff. That it is, agreed Max Wayne. You'll excuse me for a moment, gentlemen, but I find myself in a deep and urgent need of a lengthy kiss. He stood up and walked away, an impossibly tall man. He had to be almost seven feet tall, decided Shadow. A waitress wiped a cloth across the table and took their empty plates. He emptied Sweeney's ashtray and asked if they would like to order any more drinks. Wednesday told her to bring the same again for everyone, although this time, Shadow's mead was to be on the rocks. Anyway, said Wednesday, that's what I need of you if you're working for me, which, of course, you are. <sighs> that's what you want, said Shadow. Would you like to know what I want? Nothing could make me happier. The waitress brought the drinks. Shadow sipped his mead on the rocks. The ice did not help. If anything, it sharpened the sourness and made the taste linger in the mouth after the mead was swallowed. However, Shadow consoled himself. It did not taste particularly alcoholic. He was not ready to be drunk. Not yet. He took a deep breath. My life, which for three years has been a long way away from being the greatest life there has ever been, just took a distinct and sudden turn for the worse. Now, there are a few things I need to do. I want to go to Laura's funeral. I want to say goodbye. After that, if you still need me, I want to start at $500 a week. The figure was a stab in the dark, a made-up number. Wednesday's eyes revealed nothing. If we're happy working together in six months' time, you raise it to 1000 a week. He paused the longest speech he'd made in years. You say you may need people to be hurt. Well, I'll hurt people if they're trying to hurt you, but I don't hurt people for fun or for profit. I won't go back to prison. Once was enough. You won't have to, said Wednesday. No, said Shadow. I won't. He finished the last of the mead. He wondered suddenly, somewhere in the back of his head, whether the mead was responsible for losing his tongue. But the words were coming out of him like the water spraying from a broken fire hydrant in the summer, and he could not have stopped them if he had tried. I don't like you, Mr. Wednesday, or whatever your real name may be. We are not friends. I don't know how you got off that plane without me seeing you, or how you trailed me here, but I'm impressed. You have class, and I'm at a loose end right now. You should know that when we're done, I'll be gone. And if you piss me off, I'll be gone too. Until then. I'll work for you. Wednesday grinned. His smiles were strange things, Shadow decided. They contained no shred of humor, no happiness, no mirth. Wednesday looked like he had learned to smile from a manual. Very good, he said. Then we have a compact, and we are agreed. What the hell, said Shadow. Across the room, Mad Sweeney was beating quarters into the jukebox. Wednesday spat in his hand and extended it. Shadow shrugged. He spat in his own palm. J.E. class stands. 
Wednesday began to squeeze. Shadow squeezed back. After a few seconds, his hand began to hurt. Wednesday held the grip for another half minute, and then he let go. Good, he said. Good. Very good. She smiled, a brief flash, and Shadow wondered if there had been real humor in that smile. Actual pleasure. So, one last glass of evil, vile fucking mead to seal our deal, and then we are done. There'll be a Southern Comfort and Coke for me, said Sweeney, lurching back from the jukebox. The jukebox began to play the Velvet Underground's Who Loves the Sun. Shadow thought it a strange song to find on a jukebox. It seemed very unlikely, but then this whole evening had become increasingly unlikely. Shadow took the quarter he had used for the coin toss from the table, enjoying the sensation of a freshly milled coin against his fingers, producing it in his right hand between forefinger and thumb. He appeared to take it into his left hand in one smooth movement while casually finger palming it. He closed his left hand on the imaginary quarter. Then, he took a second quarter in his right hand, between finger and thumb, and as he pretended to drop that coin into the left hand, he let the palmed quarter fall into his right hand, striking the quarter he held there on the way. The chink confirmed the illusion that both coins were in his left hand, while they were now both held safely in his right. Coin tricks, is it? asked Sweeney, his chin raising, his scruffy beard bristling. Why, if it's coin tricks we're doing, watch this. He took a glass from the table, a glass that had once held mead, and he took the ice cubes into the ashtray. Then he reached out and took a large coin, golden and shining from the air. He dropped it into the glass. He took another gold coin from the air and tossed it into the glass, where it clinked against the first. He took a coin from the candle flame of the candle on the wall, another from his beard, a third from Shadow's empty left hand, and dropped them one by one into the glass. Then he curled his fingers over the glass and blew hard, and several more golden coins dropped into the glass from his hand. He tipped the glass of sticky coins into his jacket pocket and then tapped the pocket to show, unmistakably, that it was empty. There, he said, that's a coin trick for you. Shadow, who had been watching closely throughout the impromptu performance, put his head on one side. We have to talk about that, he said. I need to know how you did it. I did it, said Sweeney, with the air of one confiding a huge secret. With panache and style. That's how I did it. He laughed silently, rocking on his heels, his gappy teeth bared. Yes, said Shadow, that is how you did it. You gotta teach me. Always of doing the miser's dream that I've read about, you'd be hiding the coins in the hand that holds the glass and dropping them in while you produce and vanish the coin in your right hand. Sounds like a hell of a lot of work to me, said Mad Sweeney. It's easier just to pick them out of the air. He picked up his half-finished Southern Comfort and Coke, looked at it, and put it down on the table. Wednesday stared at both of them as if he had just discovered new and previously unimagined life forms. Then he said, Mead for you, Shadow. I'll stick with Mr. Jack Daniels and for the freeloading Irishman. A bottled beer, something dark for preference, said Sweeney. Freeloader, is it? He picked up what was left of his drink and waved it to Wednesday in a toast. May the storm pass over us and leave us hale and unharmed, he said, and knocked the drink back. A fine toast, said Wednesday. But it won't. Another mead was placed in front of Shadow. Do I have to drink this? He asked without enthusiasm. Yes, I'm afraid you do. That seals our deal. Third time's the charm, eh? Shit, said Shadow. He swallowed the meat in two large gulps. The pickled honey taste filled his mouth. There, said Mr. Wednesday. You're my man now. So, said Sweeney, you want to know the trick of how it's done? Yes, said Shadow. Were you loading them in your sleeve? They were never in my sleeve, said Sweeney. He chortled to himself, rocking and bouncing as if he were a lanky, bearded, drunken volcano, preparing to er erupt with delight at his own brilliance. It's the simplest trick in the world. I'll fight you for it. Shadow shook his head. I'll pass. Now there's a fine thing, said Sweeney to the room. Old Wednesday gets himself a bodyguard and the fellow's too scared to put up his fists even. I won't fight you, agreed Shadow. Sweeney swayed and sweated. He fiddled with the peak of his baseball cap. 
Then he pulled one of the coins out of the air and placed it on the table. What are your goals, if you were wondering? He said to me. Win or lose, and you'll lose. It's yours if you fight me. A big fellow like you. Who'd have thought you'd be a fucking coward? He's already said he won't fight you, said Wednesday. Go away, Maxley, and take your beer and leave us in peace. Sweeney took a step closer to Wednesday. Call me a freeloader, will you, doomed old creature, you cold-blooded, heartless old tree hanger. His face was turning a deep, angry red. Wednesday put out his hands, palms up, passively. Foolishness, Sweeney. Watch where you put your words. Sweeney glared at him. Then he said, with the gravity of the very drunk, You've hired a coward. What would he do if I hurt you, do you think? Wednesday turned to shadow. I've had enough of this, he said. Deal with it. Shadow got to his feet and looked up to Mad Sweeney's face. How tall was the man, he wondered. You're bothering us, he said. You're drunk, and I think you ought to leave now. A slow smile spread over Sweeney's face. There now, he said, like a little yapping dog. It's finally ready to fight. Hey, everybody, he called through the room. There's going to be a lesson learned. Watch this. He swung a huge fist at Shadow's face. Shadow jerked back. Sweeney's hand caught him beneath the right eye. He saw blotches of light and felt pain. And with that, the fight began. Sweeney fought without style, without science, with nothing but enthusiasm for the fight itself. Huge, barreling roundhouse blows that missed as often as they connected. Shadow fought defensively, carefully, blocking Sweeney's blows or avoiding them. He became very aware of the audience around him. Tables were pulled out of the way with protesting groans making a space for them in this bar. Shadow was aware at all times of Wednesday's eyes upon him, of Wednesday's humorless grin. It was a test, that was obvious, but what kind of test? In prison, Shadow had learned there were two kinds of fights. Don't fuck with me fights, where you made it as showy or impressive as you could, and private fights, real fights which were fast and hard and nasty and always over in seconds. Hey, Sweeney, said Shadow, breathless. Why are we fighting? For the joy of it, said Sweeney, sober now, or at least no longer visibly drunk. For the sheer unholy fucking delight of it. Can't you feel the joy in your own veins rising like the sap in the springtime? His lip was bleeding. So was Shadow's knuckle. So how'd you do the coin production? Asked Shadow. He swayed back and twisted a blow on his shoulder intended for his face. To tell the truth, grunted Sweeney, I told you how I did it when first we spoke, but there's none so blind. Ow, oh, it's a good one. As those who will not listen. Shadow jabbed at Sweeney, forcing him back into a table. Empty glasses, Nash race crashed to the floor. Shadow could have finished him off then. The man was defenseless, and no person would be able to do anything as far back as he was. Shadow glanced at Wednesday, who nodded. Shadow looked down at Mad Sweeney. Are we done? He asked. Mad Sweeney hesitated, then nodded. Shadow let go of him and took several steps backward. Sweeney, panting, pushed himself back up to a standing position. Not on your ass, he shouted. It ain't over till I say it is. Then he grinned and threw himself forward, swinging at Shadow. He stepped onto a fallen ice cube, and his grin turned to open-mouthed dismay as his feet went out from under, and he fell backward. The back of his head hit the barroom floor with a definite thud. Shadow put his knee into Mad Sweeney's chest. For the second time, are we done fighting? He asked. We may as well be at that, said Sweeney, raising his head from the floor. Where the joy's gone out of me now, like the pee from a small boy in a swimming pool on a hot day. And he spat the blood from his mouth and closed his eyes and began to snore in deep and magnificent snore, snores. Somebody clapped Shadow on the back. Wednesday put a bottle of beer into his hand. It tasted better than mead. Shadow woke up stretched out in the back of a sedan car. The morning sun was dazzling and his head hurt. He sat up awkwardly rubbing his eyes. Wednesday was driving. He was humming tunelessly as he drove. He had a paper cup of coffee in the cup holder. 
They were heading along what looked like an interstate highway, with the cruise control set to an even 65. The passenger seat was empty. How are you feeling this fine morning? Asked Wednesday without turning around. What happened to my car? Asked Shadow. It was a rental. Mad Sweeney took it back for you. It was part of the deal the two of you cut last night. Deal. After the fight. Fight. He put one hand up and rubbed his cheek and then he winced. Yes, there had been a fight. He remembered a tall man with a ginger beard and the cheering and whooping of an appreciative audience. I won. You don't remember, eh? Wednesday chuckled. Not so you'd notice, said Shadow. Conversations from the night before began to jostle in his head uncomfortably. You got any more of that coffee? The big man reached beneath the passenger seat and passed back an unopened bottle of water. Here, you'll be dehydrated. This will help more than coffee for the moment. We'll stop at the next gas station and get you some breakfast. You'll need to clean yourself up, too. You look like something the goat dragged in. Cat dragged in. Goat, said Wednesday. Huge, rank, stinking goat with big teeth. Shadow unscrewed the top of the water and drank. Something clinked heavily in his jacket pocket. He put his hand into the pocket and pulled out a coin the size of a half dollar. It was heavy and a deep yellow in color. It was also slightly sticky. Shadow palmed it in his right hand, classic palm, then produced it from between his third and fourth fingers. He front palmed it, holding it between his first and his little finger so it was invisible from behind, then slipped his two middle fingers under it, pivoting it smoothly into a back palm. Finally, he dropped the coin back into his left hand and replaced it into his pocket. What the hell was I drinking last night? asked Shadow. The events of the night were crowding around him now, without shape, without sense, but he knew they were there. Mr. Wednesday spotted an exit sign promising a gas station and he gunned the engine. You don't remember? No. You were drinking mead, said Wednesday. He grinned a huge grin. Mead. Yes. Shadow leaned back in the seat and sucked down water from the bottle and let the night before wash over him. Most of it he remembered. Some of it he didn't. In the gas station, Shadow bought a clean you up kit which contained a razor, a packet of shaving cream, a comb, and a disposable toothbrush packed with a tiny tube of toothpaste. Then he walked into the men's room and looked at himself in the mirror. He had a bruise under one eye. When he prodded it experimentally with one finger, he found it hurt deeply and a swollen lip. His hair was a tangle and he looked as if he had spent the first half of last night fighting and then the rest of the night fast asleep, fully dressed in the backseat of a car. Tinny music played in the background. It took him some moments to identify it as the Beatles' School on the Hill. Shadow washed his face with the restroom's liquid soap, then he lathered his face and shaved. He wet his hair and combed it back. He brushed his teeth. Then he washed the last traces of the soap and the toothpaste from his face with lukewarm water. He stared back at his reflection. Clean shaven, but his eyes were still red and puffy. He looked older than he remembered. He wondered what Laura would say when she saw him, and then he remembered that Laura wouldn't say anything ever again. And he saw his face in the mirror tremble, but only for a moment. He went out. I look like shit, said Shadow. Of course you do, agreed Wednesday. Wednesday took an assortment of snack food up to the cash register and paid for that and their gas chaining his mind twice about whether he was dealing with plastic or with cash, to the irritation of the gum-chewing young lady behind the till. Shadow watched as Wednesday became increasingly flustered and apologetic. He seemed very old, suddenly. The girl gave him his cash back and put the purchase on the card, and then gave him the card receipt and took his cash, then returned the cash and took a different card. Wednesday was obviously on the verge of tears, an old man made helpless by the implacable plastic march, of the modern world. Shadow checked out the payphone. An out of order sign hung on it. They walked out of the warm gas station and their breath steamed in the air. You want me to drive? 
asked Chetta. Hell no, said Wednesday. The freeway slipped past them, browning grass meadows on each side of them. The trees were leafless and dead. Two blackbirds stared at them from a telegraph wire. Hey, Wednesday. What? The way I saw it in there, you never paid for the gas. Oh? The way I saw it, she wound up paying you for the privilege of having you in her gas station. You think she's figured it out yet? She never will. So what are you, a two-bit con artist? Wednesday nodded. Yes, he said. I suppose I am. Among other things. He swung out into the left lane to pass a truck. The sky was a bleak and uniform gray. It's gonna snow, said Shadow. Yes. Sweeney, did, did he actually show me how we did the trick with the gold coins? Oh, yes. I can't remember. It'll come back. It was a long night. Several small snowflakes brushed their windshield, melting in seconds. Your wife's body is on display at Wendell's funeral parlor at present, said Wednesday. Then after lunch, they will take her from there to the graveyard for the interment. How do you know? I called ahead while you were in the john. You know where Wendell's funeral parlor is? Shadow nodded. The snowflakes whirled and dizzied in front of them. This is our exit, said Shadow. The car stole off the interstate and passed the cluster of motels to the north of Eagle Point. Three years had passed. Yes, the Super 8 motel had gone, torn down, and its place was a Wendy's. There were more stoplights, unfamiliar storefronts. They drove downtown. Shadow asked Wednesday to slow as they drove past the muscle farm. Closed indefinitely, said the hand-lettered sign on the door, due to bereavement. Left on Main Street, past a new tattoo parlor in the Armed Forces Recruitment Center, then the Burger King, and familiar and unchanged Olson's Drugstore. And at last, the yellow brick facade of Wendell's Funeral Parlor. A neon sign in the front window said, House of Rest. Blank tombstone stood unchristened and uncarved in the window beneath the sign. Wednesday pulled up in the parking lot. Do you want me to come in? He asked. Not particularly. Good. The grin flashed without humor. There's business I can be getting on with while you say your goodbyes. I'll get rooms for us at the Motel America. Meet me there when you're done. Shadow got out of the car and watched it pull away. Then he walked in. The dimly lit corridor smelled of flowers and a furniture polish with just the slightest tang of formaldehyde and rot beneath the surface. At the far end was the Chapel of Rest. Shadow realized that he was palming the gold coin, moving it compulsively from a back palm to a front palm to a downs palm, over and over. The weight was reassuring in his hand. His wife's name was on a sheet of paper beside the door at the far end of the corridor. He walked into the Chapel of Rest. Shadow knew most of the people in the room, Laura's family, her workmates at the travel agency, several of her friends. They all recognized him. He could see it in their faces. There were no smiles, though no hellos. At the end of the room was a small dais, and on it a cream-colored casket, with several displays of flowers arranged about it. Scarlets and yellows and whites and deep, bloody purples. He took a step forward. He could see Laura's body from where he was standing. He did not want to walk forward. He did not dare to walk away. A man in a dark suit, Shadow guessed he worked at the funeral home, said, Sir, would you like to sign the condolence and remembrance book? And pointed him to a leather-bound book open on a small lectern. He wrote Shadow and the date in his precise handwriting, then slowly, he wrote puppy beside it, putting off walking toward the end of the room where the people were in the casket and the thing in the cream casket that was no longer Laura. 
A small woman walked in from the corridor and hesitated. Her hair was a coppery red and her clothes were expensive and very black. Widow's weeds, thought Shadow, who knew her well. Audrey Burton, Robbie's wife. Audrey was holding a sprig of violets wrapped at the base with silver foil. It was the kind of thing a child would make in June, thought Shadow, but violets were out of season. Audrey looked directly at Shadow and there was no recognition in her eyes. Then she walked across the room to Laura's casket. Shadow followed her. Laura lay with her eyes closed and her arms folded across her chest. She wore a conservative blue suit he did not recognize. Her long brown hair was out of her eyes. It was his Laura and it was not. Her repose, he realized, was what was unnatural. Laura was always such a restless sleeper. Audrey placed her sprig of summer violets on Laura's chest. Then she pursed her blackberry-colored lips, worked her mouth for a moment, and spat hard onto Laura's dead face. The spit caught Laura on the cheek and began to drip down toward her ear. Audrey was already walking toward the door. Shadow hurried after her. Audrey, he said. This time she recognized him. He wondered if she was taking tranquilizers. Her voice was distant and detached. Shadow, did you escape or did they let you out? Let me out yesterday, I'm a free man, said Shadow. What the hell was that all about? She stopped in the dark corridor. The violets, they were always her favorite flower. When we were girls, we used to pick them together. Not the violets. Oh, that, she said. She wiped a speck of something invisible from the corner of her mouth. Well, I would have thought that was obvious. Not to me, Audrey. They didn't tell you. Her voice was calm, emotionless. Your wife died with my husband's cock in her mouth, Shadow. She turned away, walked out into the parking lot, and Shadow watched her leave. He went back into the funeral home. Someone had already wiped away the spit. None of the people at the viewing were able to meet Shadow's eye. Those who came over and talked to him did so as little as they could, mumbled awkward commiserations, and fled. After lunch, Shadow ate at the Burger King, was the burial. Laura's cream-colored coffin was interred in a small non-denominational cemetery on the edge of town. Unfenced, a hilly woodland meadow filled with black granite and white marble headstones. He rode to the cemetery in the Wendell's hearse with Laura's mother. Mrs. McCabe seemed to feel that Laura's death was Shadow's fault. If you'd been here, she said, this would never have happened. I don't know why she married you. I told her, time and again I told her, but they don't listen to their mothers, do they? She stopped, looked more closely at Shadow's face. Have you been fighting? Yes, he said. Barbarian, she said. Then she set her mouth, raised her head so her chin quivered, and stared straight ahead of her. To Shadow's surprise, Audrey Burton was also at the funeral, standing toward the back. The short service ended, the casket was lowered into the cold ground. The people went away. Shadow did not leave. He stood there with his hands in his pockets, shivering, staring at the hole in the ground. Above him, the sky was iron gray, featureless and flat as a mirror. It continued to snow erratically and ghost-like tumbling flakes. There was something he wanted to say to Laura and he was prepared to wait until he knew what it was. The world slowly began to lose light and color. Shadow's feet were going numb while his hands and face hurt from the cold. He burrowed his hand into his pockets for warmth and his fingers closed about the gold coin. He walked over to the grave. This is for you, he said. Several shovels of earth had been emptied onto the casket, but the hole was far from full. He threw the gold coin into the grave of Laura, and he pushed more earth into the hole to hide the coin from acquisitive grave diggers. He brushed the earth from his hands and said, 
Good night, Laura. Fanny said, I'm sorry. He turned his face toward the lights of the town and began to walk back into Eagle Point. His motel was a good two miles away, but after spending three years in prison, he was relishing the idea that he could simply walk and walk, forever if need be. He could keep walking north and wind up in Alaska, or head south to Mexico and beyond. He could walk to Patagonia or to Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire. He tried to remember how it had got his name. He remembered reading as a boy of naked men crouched by fires to keep warm. A car drew up beside him. The windows hummed down. You want a lift, Shadow? asked Audrey Burton. No, he said, not from you. He continued to walk. Audrey drove beside him at three miles an hour. Snowflakes danced in the beams of her headlights. I thought she was my best friend, said Audrey. We talk every day. When Robbie and I had a fight, she'd be the first one to know. We'd go down to Chi Chi's for margaritas and talk about what scum pots men can be. And all the time, she was fucking him behind my back. Please go away, Audrey. I just want you to know I had good reason for what I did. He said nothing. Hey, she shouted, hey, I'm talking to you. Shadow turned. Do you really want me to tell you that you were right when you spit in Laura's face? Do you want me to say it didn't hurt or that what you told me made me hate her more than I miss her? It's not gonna happen, Audrey. She drove beside him for another minute, not saying anything. Then she said, so how was prison, Shadow? It was fine, said Shadow. You would have felt right at home. She put her foot down on the gas then, making the engine roar and drove on and away. With the headlights gone, the world was dark. Twilight faded into night. Shadow kept expecting the act of walking to warm him up, to spread warmth through his icy hands and feet. It didn't happen. Back in prison, Loki Lysmith had once referred to the little poison Back in prison, Loki Lysmith had once referred to the little prison cemetery out behind the infirmary as the Bone Orchard, and the image had taken root in Shadow's mind. That night, he had dreamed of an orchard under the moonlight, of skeletal white trees, their branches ending in bony hands, their roots going deep down into the graves. There was fruit that grew upon the trees in the Bone Orchard in his dream, and there was something very disturbing about the fruit in the dream, but on waking, he could no longer remember what strange fruit grew on the trees, or why he found it so repellent. Cars passed him. Shadow wished that there was a walk. He tripped on something that he could not see in the dark and sprawled into the ditch on the side of the road, his right hand sinking into several inches of cold mud. He climbed to his feet and wiped his hands on the leg of his pants. He stood there, awkwardly. He only had enough time to observe that there was someone beside him before something wet was forced over his nose and mouth, and he tasted harsh chemical fumes. This time, the ditch seemed warm and comforting. Shadow's temples felt as if they had been reattached to the rest of his skull with roofing nails, and his vision was blurred. His hands were bound behind his back with what felt like some kind of straps. He was in a car, sitting on leather upholstery. For a minute, he wondered if there was something wrong with his depth perception, and then he understood that no, the other seat really was that far away. There were people sitting beside him, but he could not turn to look at them. The fat young man at the other end of the stretch line took a can of Diet Coke from the cocktail bar and popped it open. He wore a long black coat made of some silky material and he appeared barely out of his teens. A spattering of acne glistened on one cheek. He smiled when he saw that Shadow was awake. Hello, Shadow, he said. Don't fuck with me. Okay, said Shadow. I won't. Can you drop me off at the Motel America up by the interstate? Hit him, said the young man to the prison person on Shadow's left. A punch was delivered to Shadow's solar plexus, knocking the breath from him, doubling him over. He straightened up slowly. I said, don't fuck with me. That was fucking with me. Keep your answer short and to the point, or I'll fucking kill you. Or maybe I won't kill you. Maybe I'll have the children break every bone in your fucking body. 
There are 206 of them, so don't fuck with me. Got it, said Shadow. The ceiling lights in the limo changed color from violet to blue, then to green and to yellow. You're working for Wednesday, said the young man. Yes, said Shadow. What the fuck is he after? I mean, what's he doing here? He must have a plan. What's the game plan? I started working for Mr. Wednesday this morning, said Shadow. I'm an errand boy. Maybe a driver if he ever lets me drive. We've barely exchanged a dozen words. And you're saying you don't know? I'm saying I don't know. The boy stared at him. He swigged some coke from the can, belched, stared some more. Would you tell me if you did know? Probably not, admitted Shadow. As you say, I'm working for Mr. Wednesday. The boy opened his jacket and took out a silver cigarette case from an inside pocket. He opened it and offered a cigarette to Shadow. Smoke? Shadow thought about asking for his hands to be untied, but decided against it. No, thank you, he said. The cigarette appeared to have been hand-rolled, and when the boy lit it with the matte black Zippo lighter, the odor that filled it limo was not tobacco. It wasn't pot, either, decided Shadow. It smelled a little like burning electrical parts. The boy inhaled deeply, then held his breath. He let the smoke trickle out from his mouth, pulled it back into his nostrils. Shadow suspected that he had practiced that in front of a mirror for a while before doing it in public. If you've lied to me, said the boy, as if from a long way away, I'll fucking kill you. You know that. So you said? The boy took another long drag on his cigarette. The lights inside the limo transmuted from orange to red and back to purple. You say you're staying at the Motel America? He tapped on the driver's window behind him. <clears throat> the glass window lowered. Hey. Motel America by the interstate. We need to drop off our guest. The driver nodded and the glass rose up again. The glinting fiber optic lights inside the limo continued to change, cycling through their set of dim colors. It seemed to shadow that the boy's eyes were glinting too. The green of an antique computer monitor. You tell Wednesday this, man. You tell him he's history. He's forgotten. He's old. And he better accept it. Tell him that we are the future and we don't give a fuck about him or anyone like him. His time is over, yes? You fucking tell him that, man. He has been consigned to the dumpster of history while people like me ride our limos down the superhighway of tomorrow. I'll tell him, said Shadow. He was beginning to feel lightheaded. He hoped that he was not going to be sick. Tell him that we have fucking reprogrammed reality. Tell him that language is a virus and that religion is an operating system and that prayers are just so much fucking spam. Tell him that or I'll fucking kill you said the young man mildly from the smoke. Got it, said Shadow. You can let me out here, I can walk the rest of the way. The young man nodded. Good talking to you, he said. The smoke had mellowed him. You should know that if we do fucking kill you, then we'll just delete you. You got that one click and you're overwritten with random ones and zeros. Undelete is not an option. He tapped on the window behind him. He's getting off here, he said. Then he turned back to Shadow, pointed to a cigarette. Synthetic toad skins, he said. You know they can synthesize bufotinin now? The car stopped. The person to Shadow's right got out and held the door open for Shadow. Shadow climbed out awkwardly, his hands tied behind his back. He realized that he had not yet got a clear look at either of the people who had been in the back seat with him. He did not know if they were men or women, old or young. Shadow's bones were cut. The nylon strips fell to the tarmac. Shadow turned around. The inside of the car was now one writhing cloud of smoke through which two lights glinted, copper-colored, like the beautiful eyes of a toad. It's all about the dominant fucking paradigm, Shadow. Nothing else is important. And hey, sorry to hear about your old lady. The door closed, and the stretch limo drove off, quietly. Shadow was a couple of hundred yards away from his motel, and he walked there, breathing the cold air, past red and yellow and blue lights advertising every kind of fast food a man could imagine, as long as it was a hamburger. And he reached the Motel America, 
without incident.